Well, Prime Minister, welcome to Britain. Good to be with you and great to be in London. I have a strict rule, I have to confess, normally. I don't fraternise with any Australians in the run-up to an Ashes series, <laughs> but I have made an exception for you. Well, it's going to be a cracker <laughs> of a series and uh, hopefully will go well. Any prediction? I always think we're going to win. Even when we were rubbish, I thought we were going to win. You've got to, you've got to back your team. But I think uh, yeah, our, our bowling attack is terrific. Uh, if Dave Warner can hit form, as he did with his, his 200. One of the things about Dave is that every time he gets written off, he comes out and does very well. So I'm very, very positive and I'm looking forward to watching it. You want to hear my prediction? I'm sure I know what it'll be. 5-0. You're going to get... 5 nil. You're going seriously. You're going to get buzzballed within one inch of your lives. No. Well, I must, <laughs> I must say that the style of cricket that England are playing is quite transformative. It's mm. terrific. It's exciting. And I'm a Test cricket fan. So it's great that I think younger people will come back to Test cricket uh, because I think it's the form of the game. There's something about going and chilling out even when not much is happening, uh, it's something quite relaxing during those five-day tests. Well, I will say to my American friends, the great thing about cricket is it uh, an Ashes series, five matches, each one lasts five days, each day seven to eight hours, and at the end of it all, the score might be 0-0. Zero, zero. <laughs> That's true. I mean, true. look at us like we're completely nuts. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think we are going to get results I think uh, we will. from, uh, they're both very attacking teams. A legendary Australian cricketer, Keith Miller, who flew with your Air Force in World War II. I was once asked about pressure, and he said, pressure is having a Messerschmitt up your bleep. <laughs> You've been Prime Minister not even a year yet. <laughs> How's it going? I mean, how, just the reality, when I last saw you, you, you were contesting the federal election, and you've been a career politician, but this moment now, this period, what's it been like for you? Well, I'm enjoying it. It's mm. an incredible privilege and an honour to uh, be the Prime Minister of a, a country that I love dearly and one that I think is the greatest country on earth with respect to the UK, uh, but I think can be even greater in the future. And it's an exciting time uh, for us. I'm very proud of what my government has done. In, in the first 12 months, what you can do really is just set the agenda and give uh, the narrative. What's the character of a government? And I think my government's a government that delivers on our commitments, that gets things done, that is making a practical difference to people's lives, that addresses immediate challenges, but also never has our eye off that medium and long-term changes that we need to do. You're here for our coronation of King Charles III. How do you feel about that? You're a lifelong Republican. <laughs> what are you doing here, Prime Minister? <laughs> Well, I think you can be a lifelong Republican, which I am, and still respect our institutions. And certainly I have a great deal of respect for King Charles. I am having an audience with him this afternoon and I'm very much looking forward... Me in the morning, the King in the afternoon. I, I like the way your schedule's going, Prime Minister. I'm very much uh, looking forward to it. Uh, I had a terrific meeting with him at the Palace uh, when I was here for his mother's funeral, uh, that was a real moment of, of reflection. That was an extraordinary time. And it's a great honour to be here representing Australia. All Australians uh, wish uh, King Charles well, uh, regardless of the different views that people will have about our constitutional arrangements. The Queen, you were here for the funeral, as you said, and you actually went to her lying in state at Westminster Hall. What was that experience like for you? It was very moving. I mean, the, the Queen uh, Elizabeth was, of course, the only uh, head of state uh, in my lifetime mm. up to that point. And she was a constant in our lives, a, a reassuring presence. So her passing was uh, something that was a very significant event. Uh, but she also, I think, was very loved and respected by all. Uh, to lead uh, your nation and the Commonwealth uh, for seven decades is extraordinary. We won't see that. Certainly you and I won't mm. see that uh, again. And I think uh, people uh, 
the, the queues, as we, we went running one morning along the Thames and the queues of people, including Australians who had travelled mm. uh, to London in order to queue for 36 hours to pay their respects to uh, the, the, Her Majesty lying in state, uh, was a remarkable time. When you were standing there with your partner and you were paying your own personal respects, did you feel emotional in that moment, notwithstanding your, your long-held position about the monarchy? Well, it's a moment in history. I had the great honour of... I met uh, Queen Elizabeth at the, uh, at the palace uh, during the first G20 that was held during the global financial crisis. And her leadership and her capacity, uh, her strength, uh, was quite remarkable and her passing was a very significant moment in the world's history and unlike even uh, previous uh, monarchs of course uh, she uh, came to that position at such a young age and during the era the first era of television modern communications so the pressure that she was under uh, during those seven decades of course grew and she carried uh, herself with such dignity and grace during that entire period. Your birth was actually delayed because of the Queen. <laughs> well, uh, my, <laughs> true, right? My, my mother was, well, kind of true. Uh, my mother was on her way to the hospital in 1963 uh, and the Queen was, of course, visiting uh, Australia and my mother insisted on going through the streets and seeing the banners mm. and the commemorations for her visit on the way to give birth to me. So uh, that, that was my mum and that, was, that is something, uh, that is an example. My, my mother uh, voted uh, uh, yes in the mm. Republic, but she had enormous respect for Her Majesty the Queen. This question of what happens to Australia whether it becomes a republic, is obviously, it's not going to go away. Many people think it's inevitable. Hugh Jackman was recently quoted, one of your great national heroes, saying it's inevitable. You voted in the 1999 referendum in favour of a republic and said it's inevitable. Everybody accepts that. But that referendum came back 55% against, 45% uh, saying yes to a republic. My first question, are you going to have another referendum while you're Prime Minister? My uh, sole priority that I've put forward uh, for constitutional change is to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our constitution and to listen to them through a, a voice, what's called a voice, essentially that they be consulted on matters that affect them. And that's a referendum that will hold between October and December. Uh, that's my timetable. Uh, I'm not looking beyond that. Uh, I think that Australia should have uh, an Australian as our head of state. I don't shy away from that. I haven't changed my views. Uh, but my priority is constitutional recognition. I can't imagine uh, going forward, for example, as was suggested, has been suggested by some legitimately, that uh, we should be having another referendum on the Republic. Uh, before that occurs, for me, uh, the, the, the absolute priority is, but once you've the, done is that, that recognition. Right, but once you've done that, it would be odd for somebody who's such a die-hard Republican as you, notwithstanding your respect for the key players in the royal family and the monarchy, which you've shown in this interview already, notwithstanding that, it would be very odd, wouldn't it, if you were a Prime Minister and you didn't want another referendum? I mean, otherwise, what's been the point of posing it all this time? Well, look, I, I, I think at some stage in the future uh, that will occur. Uh, Would but, you like it to happen but under your tenure? What I don't want to do is to be a Prime Minister who presides over just constitutional debates. Mm. And that's, yeah, they're, they're big that, debates. Th and, and that's why they are. Mm. They are, but so is dealing with the challenge of climate change, mm. getting an economy that works for people, making more things in Australia, engaging in our region uh, to restore our relationships is one of the tasks that, that I've had as Prime Minister. Uh, so I've said quite clearly that that's my priority. Uh, 
you'll, you'll know because there'll be a feeling from the bottom up as well, a, a, a demand for uh, another, another vote isn't something that can be imposed from the top because it won't be successful. Uh, when that, that demand is there, I'm sure a vote will be held. How close to that feeling do you think Australia is? Because the polls uh, have been I, all over the place. I, I, I don't see it as being imminent. But if you were to win a second term, potentially you could have I, a referendum. Well, I don't see it as being imminent. You're being very diplomatic here, Prime Minister. Is that because you're here for a monarchy, which many of your supporters would be like, well, hang on, you come here to London to watch a king being crowned at the head of an institution that you just don't agree with? No, but part of, part of the job of being the Australian Prime Minister is to represent all Australians, mm. uh, not just to uh, put forward my own views, which are clearly there, but it is important that the Australian Prime Minister and the Governor-General and all of the Governors, and we have some prominent Australians uh, coming along as, as well on Saturday. Sam Kerr, yeah. great footballer. Yeah. Uh, she will be the flag bearer on on Saturday and, and I chose her, put her forward. I thought that was a really appropriate thing to do. Someone who's a, a, a young, dynamic uh, Australian sportswoman uh, who hopefully will lead us to World Cup glory uh, in uh, the Women's World Cup that's, uh, that's coming up, being hosted in Australia in a couple of months' time. Uh, so but what are you going to do in Westminster Abbey when you are urged to say the oath of allegiance? I do, to King Charles. I, I do that every term. Oh, I know, but are you going to say it in the Abbey with I, the world's cameras watching? I, I, I will do what's entirely appropriate as the representative of Australia, which is Australians made a choice in 1999. And one of the things that you've got to do is to accept democratic outcomes. Oh, we made that choice mm. and uh, I will... Uh, certainly uh, engage in that spirit. So you uh, will say the oath. As I have, uh, as I have done 10 times uh, when no, I, no, I get I know sworn that, into Parliament. But it, yes. But just to be clear, in the Abbey, there's been confusion over whether you will, as the Prime Minister of Australia in the Abbey as on the, Saturday, you will say the oath. As, as the Prime Minister of Australia, it's expected that, that I will do that. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, that uh, Australians don't have... Uh, a wide range of views, and it's also the case that as Australian Prime Minister, I'm accountable to the Australian people. I mm. mean, that, that's who I serve, and I have that great honour. Do you know the words? To? The oath. Well, I know the oath that, that I give in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in Parliament each time. I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. There's been a lot of, of, actually, I would say a lot of kickback here about this entreaty, which has come from the Archbishop of Canterbury, that the public, the British public, and a wider world, of course, including those in the Commonwealth, should all crowd round their TV sets and recite this. Because, as people have pointed out, heirs and successors... Well, that could be, if we're unlucky, Prince Andrew or, God forbid, Harry and Meghan. Well, people will make their own decisions uh, on, on Saturday, but I think it will be a very significant historic event. The Australian Republican movement, <clears throat> the Australian Republic movement has called on all Australians to pledge allegiance to Australians and Australian values on Coronation Day and not, quote, Obey the absurd request of King Charles for us to pledge fealty to him and his heirs and successors. As a Republican from Australia, what's your message to them? Uh, I pledge allegiance to the Australian people each and every day. And that's our democratic system that we have. And uh, it's one, you know, I think people will have uh, these, these views. Uh, but I think that... On but, they're, but they're your views. Uh, absolutely. Mm. I, I, I pledge my allegiance to the Australian people. They are the people I'm accountable for. But are you at all worried tomorrow that your Republican people back in Australia, the side that you actually agree with, they're going to see you on Saturday declaring your oath of allegiance no. to not just King Charles, but to all his heirs and successors, 
No, when actually, really, what you want to do is get rid of the monarchy. I mean, there <laughs> no, is a, no, no. It is no, a strange no. conundrum, right? No, no, no. Uh, our position, the, the position of the Australian Republican movement isn't about getting rid of the monarchy. That's a decision for the UK. Mm. The decision of the ARM as an Australian should be the Australian head of state. Yeah. And that's one I agree with. I think you would do that, but Australia would, I would hope, continue to be involved in the Commonwealth. But I'm of the view that an Australian should be our head of state. There's a new poll out today about the British uh, public's view of this. Overwhelming support for the monarchy. Two thirds said it may seem a strange system in this day and age, but it works. And that's kind of my view about this. I mean, I feel uneasy about this oath, to be honest. I won't be saying it the way they want me to because I'm not going to commit sure. to having allegiance to Prince Andrew and, and Prince mm. Harry. Um, but there's an interesting statement there by the public, which is they know it's a bit anachronistic. We know it's kind of weird to have people in palaces not paying proper taxes. and all. Of course we do. And yet the British public feel quite strongly the overriding benefits of a monarchy outweigh the negatives. And that's the right of the British people to determine. Uh, that's, that's the point I'm making here, I guess, as, as someone who supports an Australian head of state. We should determine who our head of state is and the United Kingdom should determine who their head of state is. But you don't have a and, view about the, the actual institution of the monarchy? Well, that, that, I, I, I'm not a monarchist. Mm. Uh, so I you would get rid of it? I, 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 well, we don't, we don't have an Australian royal family. That's, no, no. The, that's the point. Here. But you have one of our royal and family what, as your head of state. Exactly, but yeah. that's the point because that's a contradiction in itself. That's why I think Australia should have our own head of state and I'm of the view uh, that I think that should be a, an appointed head of state. There should be some uh, process whereby our democratically elected institutions in the House of Representatives and the Senate have a say in that. There's various models. That's one of the things that's held back the change in Australia is uh, the failure to agree on a way forward. But I, I would hope that Australia would still, of course, remain a member of the Commonwealth. I mean, Australia but can has... Can an undemocratic monarchy really exist going forward? Go forward 10, 20, 30 years. We've seen the rapid removal of most monarchies in Europe in the last 50 years or so. I mean, do you think that a monarchy, the idea, the concept, has any real future? Well, that's a matter for the United Kingdom. I myself am a Democrat and believe in democratic institutions and that that is how we should be governed and that is how we should determine so our you don't believe of, you don't believe in the idea of, of state no i'm a republican right. uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that i don't respect the institution uh, which is there uh, which plays a role mm. in, our, in our system of government i have to meet uh, with the, the governor general regularly uh, the governor general has to sign off on our pieces of legislation, and uh, I, I respect that. And I think that it's important that institutions which are there that have been determined be given that respect, and I see my role as the Australian Prime Minister in doing that. When you see the King later, um, how are you going to explain that you've decided to remove his image or not have his image on your $5 banknotes, <laughs> given it's always traditionally been whoever the monarch is, um, you've decided as a government you're not going to do this. Are you going to, are you going to cough up to this when you see King Charles? I, 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 I'm sure that uh, it, it won't be raised. Uh, the King's uh, portrait, the official one, will be on the back of uh, every coin. And, of course, our, our dollar notes, uh, the truth is that they've all changed at various times as well including the $5 note. So this was, I think, much ado about nothing, frankly. Uh, well, we... except you've always had the Queen's... N no, it hasn't always been on the $5 note. That's really? It, that's actually not true. And, and indeed, we, we haven't even had... We've had different uh, currencies, of course. We went decimal in, in 1966. Mm. So there's a whole history of change. So nothing personal, then? Not at all. Mm. Not at all. The decision was made actually by the Reserve Bank... Uh, wasn't even made by the government, an independent body. Uh, they consulted the government 
and uh, we were, were comfortable with the decision that was made uh, to have an, an Indigenous um, representation artwork on the $5 note, which of course with the $1 note that was abolished, that used to have. So the lowest denomination of note, of currency, used to have the Indigenous artwork on it. Meghan and Harry have dominated headlines for three years. Do you have a view about them? Do you think they should be able to keep their royal titles? Oh, I, I, I have, of all the things that come across my <laughs> desk that I'm concerned about, global inflation, uh, the increasingly insecure world, the war in Ukraine, uh, dealing with the challenge of climate change, I've got to say, Harry and Meghan have uh, not uh, been front and centre of my thoughts. Will you be seeking Harry out in the Abbey for a little chat? Uh, uh, I spoke to uh, Harry very briefly at, the, at the, his, his mother's funeral. Uh, his grandmother. And, uh, his grandmother, yeah. sorry, and passed on my uh, respects. Mm. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I'll see him or not, but if I did, I'd say hello. Australia's other queen, Dame Edna Everidge, very sadly <laughs> died. Barry Humphreys, who created that amazing comic character. Um, what were your thoughts about Barry Humphreys? Just that Barry Humphreys was the quintessential Australian character. Uh, Barry Humphreys brought uh, Australians, Australian larrikinism, really, to life. And in the characters, uh, including, of course, most famously uh, Dame Edna, but Sandy Stone, and mm. and of course, Les who Patterson. can forget? <laughs> who can forget uh, that great Australian politician, Les Patterson? Uh, Australians have a particular sense of humour. Um, I think British humour is different from uh, American humour. I'm, I'm a I'm a fan of Monty Python going mm. back and Blackadder and and shows like that that could only have come from the UK. Barry Humphreys could only have come from Australia. Mm. Um, what Barry Humphreys would say is taking the piss out of ourselves. Mm. And he did it so well and for such a long period of time. Uh, so it was a big loss for the Australian arts community and, of course, uh, he was uh, equally as big here in the mm. United Kingdom. Uh, and it says something about our common history that, that we share and that engagement and interaction. I don't know that Barry Humphreys was very big in the United States mm. or in Asia or in, uh, in continental Europe. But in the United Kingdom, he was big. And in Australia, he was, of course, larger than life. And there was a great deal of mourning of him. His comedy, rather like uh, actually Monty Python, Blackadder, all those kind of shows, which I love too, uh, almost certainly wouldn't survive the modern curse of cancel culture <laughs> because of the inappropriateness, <laughs> apparently. Barry Humphreys was cancelled by the Melbourne International Comedy Show. They took his name off a top award for him being allegedly transphobic. What did you feel about that? Well, it's, I, I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of that, I must say, until recent, recent mm. times. And, and I think uh, people... Uh, legitimately can put forward uh, their concerns about someone's comments uh, that were made then. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I think that we've got to be able to, to laugh at ourselves. Uh, I think that a, a lot of humour, you're quite right, that a lot of humour that used to be on, I mean, Faulty Towers, mm. I'm, I'm not sure how that would go. Never, never make it. I'm not sure how that the would go at the Puritan senses we now have. This whole idea of and I think culture. there were only there were only yeah you know, I think there were twelve episodes of yeah. Forty Towers and uh, they were fantastic. Mm. They, they were good fun, and they weren't um, you know in, in my view to, today you look at it and you go you know well you know uh, maybe you, you you might do it differently. But a bit like um, rewriting some books, mm. um, it is what it is at, at the time, and it's it's the uh, it, that's the context, and and I think that 
The idea of cancel culture is, in my view, uh, a, a sad development because you you often can get as well uh, pylons mm. in social media and you see it happen uh, so often and things quite often too uh, taken out of context. I mean, I, I, I try not to look at uh, too much social media but I know that sometimes people will say something to me mm. Uh, about an answer that in an interview like this without people having seen the question mm. or what was said before or, or afterwards and, and uh, make it look like something that it isn't. But uh, I think that uh, we need uh, far more... Should, should the Melbourne comedy... Far more tolerance. Should the Melbourne International Comedy uh, Institution, I guess they would call themselves, but should they have cancelled someone like Barry Anderson. Did it Actually, was that the worst kind of cancel culture? Because well, now, now, since he died, think, they've now said we want to pay homage to yeah, him and yeah, honour him, which seems yeah, to me stinking yeah, hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I'm not going to go into the past because I wasn't a part of, mm. you know, I wasn't a bit aware that that occurred. But I'll say this, that it's good that a tribute is now being made to Barry Humphreys and there will be a state funeral for Barry Humphreys mm. as well. Uh, co-hosted by uh, the New South Wales and the Victorian government and the Australian government. Mm. My government will be a part of that as well. So you won't be cancelling tribute. Him. No, we'll, we'll be paying tribute to mm. him at a state funeral. He's someone who has given a, gave an enormous amount of pleasure mm. uh, to generations of Australians. And I know that uh, a range of people who are friends of mine I uh, knew him very well. Mm. I didn't. Uh, I met him on one occasion briefly, but I didn't know him. Uh, but I know how warmly he was regarded uh, by people in Australia and in the UK. The issue that got him into hot water uh, was this issue of, of gender identity. He was defending J.K. Rowling. The New Zealand Prime Minister, New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins, um, was asked to define a woman, and he said, well, people identify for themselves. He couldn't answer, and it was excruciating to watch, to be honest with you. And this has been a, a sort of hot potato question for world leaders. Some of them seem incapable, including <laughs> Keir Starmer here. Um, but what is a woman, Prime Minister? An adult female. How difficult was that to answer? Not too hard. Uh, I, was asked, uh, I was asked during the campaign, actually, but um, I think that... Um, you know, we, we need to, I, I think, I, I respect people for whoever they are mm. and it's up to people to, uh, you know, to be re respected and, and I know that uh, there is uh, some controversy can come at times like that and, and I'm not uh, a fan of uh, some of uh, the campaign that was recently a very controversial visit uh, in Australia that was designed to uh, stir up mm. issues. And people who are, you know, young people coming to terms with their identity and who they are, I, I think that uh, they need to be respected as well. But what would you do, for example, with this issue of transgender athletes in women's sport? which many world or sporting authorities well, are, now, a, well, are now beginning to move to exclude them because they say it's simply not fair. Well, that's an example in that the sporting organisations are dealing with that issue. Uh, well, what's, was, your, what's your view? Was, uh, uh, my view is the sporting organisations should deal with that issue. Does it seem fair uh, to you uh, that, that people who were born biologically male with all the physical advantage should be able to compete against people born with female biology? Well, in Australia, the sporting codes are able to deal with that, uh, and 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 they have, and they have effectively, and uh, they've done so in a way in which during the last campaign, uh, there was one of the candidates uh, chosen who who tried to make that front and centre that issue. Mm. I've got to say, as uh, I've gone around and you know my son played uh, junior sport. Uh, for both uh, football as in soccer and Australian rules football and cricket and everything. None of these issues ever came up 
and I don't think they're front and centre. That's because it wasn't happening then. I, I, I thought, well, you didn't get biological males competing against biological women. I mean, that's that's the problem with it. To me, to me, I can support transgender rights to fairness and equality, but right to the point where they infringe on women's rights. I mean, they've got to also have fairness and equality. And that's why sporting codes uh, should be dealing with Yeah, but you're the it. Prime Minister of Australia. You must have a view. Right? No, that's why sporting codes... That's you, my view. Are you, are, you my, du are you ducking it? Right? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm saying that what it shouldn't be done is I, uh, done to try to politicise an issue mm. that should be made on its merits based upon the proper assessment of whether it's fair or not, uh, but done in a way as well that doesn't seek to uh, essentially target a very vulnerable group. And that's my concern Well, I don't think they should be demonised well. in any and, way. And that's my yeah. concern yeah, I, I get, as well. I get that, but and, I think there's so, also, there are uh, serious issues which uh, have to be addressed. Of, of course they are, but it should be done. Uh, without the targeting of a vulnerable group of people, and, and that's my view, that people should be respected, the sporting codes are dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And what occurred when this debate happened in Australia is the sporting codes said themselves, we're dealing with this. We don't need this to be politicised, mm -hmm. and we don't need politicians buying into it. You're going to see Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, I will. while you're here. Um, are you going to mention that you've just been... Uh, in a poll, named the third most popular global leader while he languishes at number 10, and that you also made Time magazine's 100 most influential people. And, uh, in fact, the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, and, in fact, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, said that you were effectively a progressive champion around the world. I mean, it's been a good, good couple of months for you, Prime Minister. Well, well uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was very generous uh, in his comments uh, I wasn't aware that uh, I had been named or that he was writing the citation until it was uh, pointed out to me by the media. I did send him a, uh, a little message saying thank you for his generous comments and I, I am looking forward to seeing him uh, again uh, on the weekend. He, of course, will be here at the coronation as the leader of another Commonwealth country. As for the first, that's the first I've heard of it, but I, I won't be raising that with Rishi Sunak. <laughs> uh, this is my third meeting uh, with him, and we'll be talking about the free trade agreement mm. that can make an enormous difference for Australia and for the UK about how we can have mutual benefit from increased economic engagement. And, of course, we'll also be talking about our AUKUS arrangements, uh, further strengthening the cooperation when it comes to our, our defence. One of your predecessors, Paul Keating, wasn't exactly complimentary about the AUKUS arrangement. He described your $368 billion deal for the nuclear submarines as uh, the worst deal in history. He said you could have had 40 to 50 conventional subs instead. He also attacked you for working with the UK. He said after the great problem of Brexit, after that fool Johnson, Boris, destroyed their place in Europe, they're going to put together global Britain. So they're looking around for suckers. Are you a sucker, Prime Minister? <laughs> the AUKUS arrangement, to me, uh, should surprise no one. Uh, Australia, if you look at our, our, our history, we have 65,000 of proud history, the oldest continuous culture on Earth is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. But then we have... Uh, the relationship with Britain. And that's a relationship that goes back uh, to 1788, to the First Fleet. And ever since then, we have stood side by side as great democratic nations. Our parliament takes the Westminster system as the basis of our, our democracy. And we have common interests, of course, since the Second World War in particular, under Labor's Prime Minister, John Curtin, we turn to the United States ever since then. The United States has been uh, our most critical alliance partner. So getting greater cooperation between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States, not just in Australia being able to build our own uh, nuclear-powered submarines, uh, is, uh, to my mind, a, a very sensible thing to do in today's uncertain world. And I, I know... Former Prime Minister Keating made some uh, colourful comments mm. 
Uh, I have every respect for Paul, but on this, I just disagree with him. Was Brexit a good idea? Uh, that was a matter for the United Kingdom. So was it a good idea? Well, as the Australian Prime Minister, I don't see it as my place uh, to uh, put forward uh, matters uh, which are strictly uh, a matter for the people and the government of the United Kingdom. One of the big reasons for AUKUS, of course, is the ongoing threat of China potentially invading Taiwan. Paul Keating said this, I dare the Prime Minister to explicitly suggest or leave open the question that Australia might go to war over Taiwan at the urgings of the United States or anyone else. So, I dare you to answer that question, Prime Minister. Well, I want a region that is peaceful, that is secure, that is stable and that is prosperous. And that's what we're working towards. But one of the ways that we're also engaging in the region is by lifting up our national security. We don't apologise for that. We have the AUKUS arrangements. We've just had our Defence Strategic Review as well uh, to look at what are the capabilities that Australia needs and where do we need them. But do you think China may where invade Taiwan as many do? Well, I don't think it is constructive to speculate on matters uh, like that. We support the status quo when it comes to Taiwan. Would you, would you support Taiwan if they were invaded? We are, Taiwan is not, uh, is not assisted by people speculating on hypotheticals. We support... So, well, President Biden has. We, we, He's already said that America would support them. We support the status quo being maintained. We support stability in the region. And we're investing in our capability but we're investing in something else as well. We're investing in our relationships, whether it's AUKUS, whether it's ASEAN, whether it's our Pacific friends through the Pacific uh, relationships that we have, rebuilding them. But also, we're engaging in the region. Uh, my government hasn't engaged in uh, rhetoric that is inflammatory. What we've said uh, with regard to China is that uh, we will, uh, we will uh, cooperate where we can, uh, we'll disagree where we must, and we'll engage in our national interest. But you wouldn't just sit back, would you? So you I, wouldn't sit back if Taiwan was invaded. You wouldn't sit well, back as Australia's Prime Minister and just well, do I nothing. Well, I don't see it as constructive uh, to, uh, to speculate on, on hypotheticals. Right. What's important, and, and the role of peace and security and stability in the region is advanced by having a very clear position, which is support for the status quo of no unilateral action uh, by uh, either side in, uh, in, in those issues. And our position on, on China has been to engage constructively, uh, but to continue to put forward that uh, the impediments to trade should be removed to say very directly to President Xi uh, that Australians such as Cheng Li uh, need to be given uh, proper justice mm. and that they're not receiving that at the moment and to raise those issues, to raise human rights issues. So we don't shy away from that, uh, but we do so in a way that's constructive and respectful. And that's how you advance uh, diplomacy. That's how you advance positive outcomes. OK. President Biden has said he's running again for, for office in 2024. He would be 82 and he'd be 86 at the end of a second term. Is he too old? Uh, that's a matter for the United States, but I don't believe that... Do you want to be Prime Minister at 86? Anyway, we'll see how I go. <laughs> we'll see how I go. That will have sent a shiver, shiver down your opponent's spine. But, but can I say this about President Biden? I think he is doing an extraordinary job. Uh, I regard him as a friend of mine. I regard uh, him as an important uh, leader of uh, our most important ally. I'll be welcoming President Biden to Australia this month uh, for the Quad Leaders meeting. And he, through his actions, not just in international relations where uh, he is strengthening the United States' engagement in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, that's something that we welcome, uh, 
But you don't think he's too old. We will. And your dealings with him, you don't get a feeling of a Not guy. at all. Not at all. He is totally on top of his brief. He's someone who's uh, very conscious about uh, regional affairs in the Indo-Pacific region. He's someone who's engaged uh, with uh, our, our friends with uh, uh, in ASEAN. I notice uh, today he has uh, the leader of the Philippines, Bong Bong Marcus, mm. uh, there hosting uh, him in the White House. He's also got to engage with potentially Donald Trump if right. Trump wins a Republican nomination. President Trump is actually in Britain at the moment. Are you going to hook up with him? Are you going to? No, no. I I engage with uh, with President Biden. I look forward to uh, meeting him. In Would you be happy to engage with Trump if he was to win the White May? House back? Uh, our relationship with the United States is a relationship between countries and between peoples, uh, based upon our common democratic values. You'd have no problem dealing with so, Donald Trump if he won. Well, won't. well. I, it's not up to me to no, determine... No. But you wouldn't have any trouble dealing with it. No, he I, was I, I'll deal with uh, whoever, uh, the president or the prime minister... Even if he's, been, the, even or, if he's facing... Or the leader no, of He's been indicted country. on criminal charges. I that, mean, well, that, that's a matter for... you the, comfortable with that? That's a matter for the people of the United States, and I have no intention of interfering in their uh, internal uh, political processes... Uh, I expressed uh, my concern. Would an Australian about... Prime Minister, do you think, be able to... Or would an Australian politician be able to run to be Prime Minister if they were in, indicted on committing crimes? Uh, well, they would, uh, I, I think, uh, speculating on that, uh, I, in terms of either a, a Labor or a Liberal candidate would, I think, have, uh, have issues if that occurred. But... Um, Look, I said uh, very clearly, I expressed my concern about the events that occurred in the capital mm. on January 6th. I don't shy from that. I think democracy is a precious commodity. Mm. Uh, a whole lot of the world, it's under threat. And uh, that's why we need to support our democracy, uh, including uh, supporting our democratic institutions. Russell Crowe. Uh, has part-owned the South Sydney Rabbitohs, the, uh, the rugby league club, and you're a big fan of them. He's known you a long time. A former he... board member. Right, so he said this about you. Ago. With all the opaque bullshit we've had to deal with for the last 10 or 15 years, we've got a guy, you, who is at least going to tell us the truth. Now, he might not make the decisions that you, might, that you want individually every time, but over time, what Anthony will do is improve the lives of the people in this country. And he also said you never asked him for anything, unlike everybody else. <laughs> um, so he, that's, a, that's a pretty good review coming from Russell Crowe. I shouldn't think he suffers fools gladly. He thinks you're an honest person. You may make mistakes, you might get things wrong, but essentially you're an honest person. And I, and I am. And one of the things that I've uh, done as Prime Minister is to uh, say things the, the way that I see them. So we've got a budget coming up next week. Now, we'll do a number of measures to assist people with the cost of living, but we can't do everything uh, on day one. Uh, I haven't been in office for a year yet, and it follows almost a decade of, I think, a government uh, that was uh, characterised by inaction and delay and, and denial, that we were left with a trillion dollars of debt. Uh, so we've explained that, uh, but we have fulfilled the commitments that we made in the lead up uh, to the election to the best of our capacity. Uh, but of course, all, all governments and all individuals, including myself, will make mistakes from time to time. Uh, Are you unafraid to admit when you're wrong? I'll give an example. The small boats policy, which is a big issue here, big issue in Australia, you know, what you do with people who wash up on your shores, you were very opposed to it and you changed your mind. Is Correct. That, is that political expediency, the reality? No, it, well, it's looking at the facts the way that uh, they are and, and, and being upfront about it. But you said this in 2015. I couldn't ask someone else to do something I couldn't see myself doing. If people were in a boat, including families and children, I myself couldn't turn that around, but now you can. What changed? Uh, the facts. Um, 
I didn't think that... Uh, well, you still get people, at the families time, and kids turning up in boats. Right? I mean, that still happen. And, and, and they have been turned around. Hmm. Um, but are you comfortable with at that? At the time, yes, because if you look at uh, what happened in practice with boat turnbacks, uh, the view of what was occurring was that the advice uh, to us when we were in government that if you tried to do that, then they'd scuttle the boats and, and it would result in, in tragedies. Um, so uh, the, the fact is, though, that uh, the boat turnbacks policy was a part of uh, something that did make a difference. I support an orderly migration program. I have said that you can be strong on borders without being weak on humanity. So one of the things that my government has done, because we have ensured that uh, the boats, contrary to what the Conservatives said before the uh, election campaign, I must say some of the media as well said, oh, well, if, if Labor's elected, the boats will start and it'll all start back. That hasn't happened. We have kept in place strong border security measures, but we also have uh, an increasingly humane policy. So, for example, the, the people who had arrived and were in limbo for more than 10 years mm. on temporary protection visas, who no government was going to send back to Iran or to Afghanistan, we have said that they should be entitled to permanent security to become permanent residents as well. But let me ask so you... So we've me... abolished those temporary okay. protection visas. You, when you're tough on border, you're anti-cancel culture, you know what a woman is, are you sure you're a progressive left? Uh, you're I, not a secret I, Tory in disguise, eh? I, I, I'm an, an absolutely uh, consistent are you an old fashioned? Are you an old-fashioned liberal of no, my kind? No. I, an old-fashioned who actually realises the woke left is pretty nutty. I'm a social, and that way, madness lies. I'm a social democrat who believes in markets, but believes that the state, the power of the state, can make a positive difference to people's lives. That believes that the philosophy I took to the election was two, two part. No one held back and no one left behind. Mm. No one held back, what does that mean? That uh, people aspiring to a better life for themselves and for their families is a legitimate thing. We need economic growth. Mm. We need to, that's why I want to make more things in Australia. That's why I want to lift wages. That's why I want industry policy to kick in. That's why I want to challenge climate change and to tackle it because we've seen Will you be the talking to the King Charles impacts. about that? Because he's obviously been at the forefront of that for many years. Oh, he's had a very strong position in it. Has uh, he been proven right, King the, Charles, about oh, the he environment has. and climate change? He certainly has been. And one of the things about uh, King Charles over a long period of time is that the stance that he has made on climate change, on the urban environment uh, as well, on Indigenous issues, are uh, ones that I think bring him great credit. Now, I won't talk about what I will talk to him about because that the protocol is mm. that, that that remains a, a private discussion and we'll have a discussion this afternoon. Uh, but I, I certainly think that his stance on those issues has been very significant. But to go back to, because I don't want to miss the second point, second point about what a Labor Prime Minister does is we don't leave people behind. So we're looking at that in terms of the budget, but we're doing that as well with cheaper childcare to allow greater women's workforce participation. We're dealing with that as well through things like, um, I marched mm -hmm. in the Mardi Gras to show my support for inclusiveness and I'll continue to do that. We are having a referendum to give mm. Indigenous people uh, recognition in our nation's constitution. I think you can do both things, and that's something that my government is, uh, is focused on achieving. Uh, we're only one year in to, to our, our first term. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? It's been a very busy year. Promise, I want to end just, just with this. I want to show you a picture. Because I found this picture, and it, I found it very poignant, and I'm sure you will too. You probably remember no. the picture. This is a picture on a boat, and this is 1962. And there are two people in that picture. This is the TSS Fair Sky. It was a Sitmar Line boat. Tell me who's in that picture. 
Well, it's my mum sitting there on the... Uh, Mary Ann. As I see it, Mary Ann on the, the far right. She's next to her brother, mm. uh, George, uh, and uh, standing up in, in white is uh, a, a, a dashing fellow who happens to uh, be my father, uh, Carlo, uh, who was uh, a purser on the ship uh, that my mother travelled mm. to on that long journey. To about, England. To, to England, here, where she lived in London for a while. And she fell pregnant? Uh, she did. She had a relationship uh, with Carlo and uh, during, I think, not just on the ship, but clearly from piecing it together. So you were conceived when, in England? When he, quite likely, that's right. So you're actually, you're in, one of us. In, when he visited... You're English. Probably. I'm still not going for you in the ashes, so don't try that. <laughs> Don't try that on. But you accept you could have that's, been conceived in this country. That's not going to happen. I think I think chances are I was. Yeah. I think I was here uh, when the ship used to berth at Southampton. Mm. And uh, my mum uh, travelled, met him, had uh, a relationship uh, with him, uh, fell pregnant. Mm. Uh, he was, uh, in, she, when she told him, uh, he was engaged to... Uh, Someone, he's uh, the Italy. person who became uh, he, his wife back in Italy. And uh, so she went back to Australia, uh, had me, uh, made the courageous decision in 1963 to uh, be a, a single mother and to, to raise me. She was uh, very Catholic, uh, so it was a, a difficult thing for the family. And at that time... She was urged to, to have you adopted. She, she was, and that was what was very common uh, at the Your time. Your life could have been so different. It would have been very different. And at, at the time, it was to be that I had been... Uh, I would be adopted out and that uh, the story would be told in the uh, local community and in, in the family that uh, she had uh, got news of my father's death and that had caused her to the trauma to, to lose her child. Uh, but she couldn't do that. I was There was a moment where a nun at the hospital knew that she was the sort of person who didn't... She just really didn't want that to happen. She was under a bit of pressure. So she brought me into my mum and my mum was never going to let me go. What a moment. It, it, I mean, that's sliding doors... Oh, absolutely. ..of an incomparable... Enormous consequence. Oh, and she then adopted his name, Albanese. But and, continued to, and, to pretend that he had yeah, died in an accident. That's right. And I was told Including that. Including to you. Yeah, I was told that until I was old enough when she felt I could understand. You uh, were 14, I think. I was 14, 15. Uh, you know, how, and did you, how did you feel when you found out he's potentially still alive? Oh, I at the time, I mean, I was a pretty tough young kid. We had a... We had a difficult upbringing. I mean, my mum had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and was crippled up, was an invalid pensioner. We lived in a council house uh, where she had lived her, her whole life. My grandparents had died by then. Uh, so it was just me and mum. We didn't have anything economically, but I had her unconditional love, and that was enough for me. Mm. And so I said, I'm not interested uh, you know, that you're enough for me, which is what she needed to hear. So while she was alive, I didn't search for him, but she died in 2002. Mm. My son had come along uh, in 2000. And there was a moment where I was uh, at the, her gravesite and my little boy was very little, said, you know, where's your daddy? And I sort of realised that, you know, I needed to, and he had a right to ex hear, understand uh, what had happened. And so I, I had, I guess, once she passed away, I could then search for him without uh, bringing any uh, sense that she wasn't all I needed. Mm. And so I found him uh, in 2009. Well, it's an amazing story because this is nearly 40 years later. Yeah, 46 years later. I mean, incredible. I was 46 when, uh, when pure, we met. Right, and by pure chance, a friend of yours is now running 
the ship company that had been renamed several times. It was now the Carnival Cruises. You knew this woman, and she helped the search, and they find your dad's old employment Employment details in some dusty, rickety area in Genoa where the original ship stuff had all been sent. Yeah. And from that, you were able... By now, you're a, you're a minister, right, under... That's um, right. I was a minister in the Kevin government. Run. And you're able to track down your dad. And you're in a meet, or you're, you're in your office, I think, and it's a Thursday, and you get a call from this friend of yours who's running the, the ship company, and she just says, we found him. It was, it was a remarkable moment. And uh, I was chairing a, a ministerial council meeting of all the state and territory ministers, so an important meeting that night. And uh, I told my staff to go on without me, and I just took, I took my breath away. It was uh, an extraordinary moment. Emotional for and, you? Oh, it was incredibly emotional. Did you shed a tear? Was and it? then, oh, absolutely. It was, it was. Uh, I didn't realise just how significant it was, uh, because I think you, it, it is. Everyone, everyone's different, and relationships are complex, as my life story shows. Uh, but uh, for me, that sense of identity and belonging uh, was important. You know, I, I had this name, Albanese, and I'd said, uh, where's your, when asked, and I represent a big Italian constituency as well in Sydney. So when I was asked, I would say Naples because that's where the ship sailed mm. from. Uh, but in the end, it was uh, Puglia, the other side of uh, of. Italy. And six weeks there. later, you, you're there. Yeah. And, I and met... the door opens and in walks your dad. This is 46 years later. Yeah. I, we, had a, we wrote to him uh, and uh, wrote a careful letter just saying that my, my mother, Mary Ellery, was uh, known to him and that I would be visiting Italy. I was visiting the European Transport Minister at the time, uh, Tajani was based in, was an Italian. So I had a meeting with him scheduled. Uh, so I, I wrote and said, I'll be here, you know, on this day, on, on this weekend. And so uh, I met with, they had a, an intermediary, they were wondering what was going on here, I guess, had an intermediary. I told her the story and she... I said, I don't want anything else, anything out of him. Uh, I would like to meet him. I think he's my father. And so I didn't know what to expect. And then the, the very next morning I had a very short window of opportunity because I had a full schedule. I was on my way to London as well to speak at the International Maritime Organisation here, the big conference. And uh, in he walked. I didn't know what to expect and he just embraced me. And what a moment. That was quite extraordinary. How and did you feel hugging your dad that you thought was dead oh, until was, you were 14? It was an incredible moment and, and not just him but uh, my half-brother and half-sister uh, came with him. And so I, I went from having a, a, a very small family to having a much larger one and it just gave me that sense of completeness. And, and I, was, I was very lucky because he passed away in January of 2014. So we were able to meet on a few occasions. I, I travelled to Italy. I brought back, it was a short meeting, so I brought back my son to meet his grandfather in, in the following Easter. So in Easter of, of 2010. And we and spent, would any of this have happened of if time? your boy hadn't said what he'd said at your mum's graveside? Quite possibly not. Or if uh, I, someone at Carnival Cruises happened to be someone you hadn't knew. have done a lot, of, and if she hadn't have known a historian mm. who lives in Wollongong, who who knew where to look and had found this box of papers, essentially employment files. In uh, a port it's in It's an Genoa. incredible. Were you able to be there when your father died, or not? I went to uh, I went to visit him in 2013 in December, 
Uh, we lost the election in 2013, but then I'd become Deputy Prime Minister uh, before we, we lost that, that election and lost government. Uh, he wasn't well, um, so I, I went to see him. Uh, I knew that he was, he was dying. Uh, he was at home in his family flat uh, there in Puglia. And uh, we knew we were saying goodbye uh, to each other and that the last thing that he said to me was that he was glad that uh, he'd found me. Amazing. It was uh, quite, quite a journey from uh, that beginning to be Australian Prime Minister. It says a great look deal about our country. It's a hell of a I story. Think. What would they have made of you becoming Prime Minister, your parents? Um, well, my my mum would have uh, shed a tear, perhaps each and every day. I remember my first speech; she she was there up in the uh, the gallery, and I couldn't look up because if I had of, I would have been hopeless as well. Uh, she was incredibly proud, and I see uh, what I do as uh, you know her achievement without her, and that unconditional love of a parent for their their child um, which which she gave me you know she did it really tough she had she really wasn't very well when she died she was only 65 years old and she was spent uh, really at the at the end of what would she been have a made tough of life. your journey today you'll go and see the king oh she would have and you know she would have been having, having skipped the journey to hospital diverted with you That's inside right. her uh, to see the Queen. I mean, what an amazing journey that has been. Oh, look, she would, she would have been uh, wrapped by all of it mm. and uh, she would have been very proud and I, uh, I, I still think that, you know, she's, she's looking down on me and uh, she's still with me uh, each and every day because the values that I have, uh, the values uh, that uh, she gave me, and uh, I say I was raised with three great faiths, to go back to Russell Crowe being one of them, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, South Sydney Football Club and the Australian Labor Party. And uh, they're the values uh, that I have uh, and that, that I hold very dear. Prime Minister, it's been a real pleasure. What an extraordinary story uh, your story is. And thank you for sharing it with me. Yeah, thanks very and, much. And for... good luck with my king when you go and see him. I indeed. I'll, I'll say good day to him. Please do. <laughs> Great to see you. Good on you. Thank you.